welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. In this episode, I talk with Turquoise Sky Devereaux, a member of the Salish and Blackfeet tribes of Montana, owner of the consulting company Indigenous Sky LLC, where she does a range of trainings, workshops, and speaking focused on creating culturally safe spaces for Indigenous populations, as well as work with Indigenous youth and tribal communities. She also works in higher education and retention of Native students and is a PhD student in the School of Social Work at Arizona State University. Turquoise talks about colonial systems and the four stages of colonization, as well as systemic racism and oppression, and specific ways education and social work have caused and continue to cause harm to indigenous peoples and other marginalized groups. We get into how cultural competency is a myth based in a westernized colonial mentality and how it does more harm than good. Turquoise explains differences between indigenous and westernized worldviews and ways of living. She shares ways to create culturally safe spaces for indigenous populations, providing examples from her own life, as well as interviews she has done with indigenous students, in terms of ways they did not feel included in school systems, and how professors, administrators, and staff made a difference, and can make a difference, in creating safety, equity, and inclusion. I hope this conversation inspires you to action. Before we get into the interview, I want to let you all know about our episode's sponsor, the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. First off, I want to thank them for sponsoring the podcast. UH has a phenomenal social work program that offers face-to-face master's and doctorate degrees, as well as an online and hybrid MSW. They offer one of the country's only political social work programs and an abolitionist-focused learning opportunity. Located in the heart of Houston, the program is guided by their bold vision to achieve racial, social, economic, and political justice local to global. In the classroom and through research, they are committed to challenging systems and reimagining ways to achieve justice and liberation. Go to www.uh edu forward slash social work to learn more. And now, the interview. Hey, Turquoise, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Just really excited to have this conversation with you and want to give a shout out to our mutual friend, Jordan Theory, for making this connection. And just to start off, you know, maybe you could share a little bit about what you currently do. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, So I am um, part of the Salish and Blackfeet tribes of Montana. So I grew up born and raised in Montana, in Western Montana. I say it's literally one of the beautiful, most beautiful places in the world. I know I'm a little biased, but if you've ever been there, you would know. (laughs) Um, And I um, I do a lot of things, um, but primarily... um, it revolves around serving my community, um, and I run my own consulting business um, called Indigenous Sky LLC, where I do consulting on creating culturally safe spaces for Indigenous populations, pretty much on every level of social work, micro, meso, macro. And I've been doing that now for about seven years, um, And then, but I've also worked in uh, higher education institutions pretty much as my but I would say nine to five career jobs, um, recruiting and retaining Native students in higher education. Um, and yeah, I mean, and really in the realms of macro level social work, if you can think about it, I've pretty much done it. Um, and then a lot of my direct practice in social work really revolves around Native students and Indigenous youth programming um, and working with tribal communities as well. Yeah, just from our conversations, you know, before even this recording, you have a lot going on. Um, you're also a PhD student, correct? And you yeah. <laughs> you publish and you have, you know, <laughs> writings that are out there and ones that are coming as well. Yeah, I, uh, I 
It's funny because I am like in the weeds of the first semester of my PhD program and I totally feel it right now and somehow I forget to mention that. Um, but yes, I am currently a PhD student in the um, uh, School of Social Work at Arizona State University. Um, so I currently reside in, in Phoenix, Arizona and I've been here for about four years. Um, but yeah, and I, um, I also am involved in a lot of um, you know, trying to get, uh, well, I have been published in, um, I actually have an article in the um, macro level social work encyclopedia on historical intergenerational trauma um, with my mentor, Lori Walker. Um, give a huge shout out to Lori. They have literally got me to where I am today. I know we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that's just one of them. And then I do have uh, article that's in press right now that I'm really excited about because it's my first uh, first author article, and um, it really talks a lot about more, more of my work. And I know, as you mentioned, it's more of a narrative form, and so I really enjoy that because I was able to really tap into a lot of um, more like creative writing, I think you could call it, but it's it's really more digestible and less all academic, which I love. So. Yeah, those. So I also do those things. <laughs> yeah, that article, um, you know, and thank you for sharing it with me is just like a phenomenal piece. And once it's out, we can link to it, you know. So when this podcast episode gets published, it might not be out yet, but you know, I'll add it once you know the link once it's published. And and it was, yeah, it just felt like you know we could be like hanging out and you're talking about it. It's like such a powerful article and also enjoyable to read, but like clearly really heartfelt and really serious, you know, when um, you're sharing your experience and also like what it's like to be um, a native student in a space that isn't designed for you. Yeah, no, definitely. And I really, I really enjoyed that feedback because that was definitely the, um, the initiative I was trying to take when writing it. And also, I, um, because I've worked in systems like colonized systems, higher education institutions in my career, um, it also is a really great article for people who are working in those systems as well. And to understand that even if you're not just a student, it's still difficult for people of color to work in um in colonized systems as well as an employee. Um, and so I think that that highlights a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's really incredible. I hope everyone checks it out when that is out. You know, so I know we're going to talk mostly about creating culturally safe spaces for indigenous populations. Uh, but before we, you know, get more into that, um, you know, how did you get involved in this work? Yeah, so uh, I, so as an Indigenous person, which, you know, coming from a very collectivist community, which, um, you know, a lot of people, um, if you understand the different types of worldviews, it just means that, you know, serving my community was really always a priority and what I wanted to do in my career, no matter what it was I wanted to go into. Um, and so, uh, but my junior year of college, in my undergrad, I um, was really uh, questioning <laughs> whether uh, school was for me, uh, which is kind of crazy to say now as I'm going into and started my PhD program. But um, right. yeah, <laughs> it's kind of nuts to think about. But um, my mentor, Lori Walker, was actually a person who um, for, you know, the first time in my undergraduate career really uh, gave me a voice in the classroom. And, um, so I really trusted, um, them to, you know, cause they were providing me this platform to really talk about my community and, and the struggles that we have and, and also like the beauty of my community. And so then when I let Lori know, you know, I might not want to stay in social work because everything I'm learning just isn't, isn't working. And, um, Lori was like, don't leave. And here's an article about Native women and social work. <laughs> and um, and so honestly, like that support has, has, like I said, brought me to where I am today. But um, 
when I was in, so I stayed and then my senior year, Lori was a part of um, my practicum, which is our internship, you know, for the last semester of our undergrad in our school in this um, social work field. And I got the opportunity to intern at American Indian Student Services at the University of Montana. And I did a program evaluation. I had no idea what I was doing, like absolutely no idea. Uh, All I knew is I wanted to make the campus a better place for Native students. And I wanted to do um, focus groups with Native students to get their perspectives. And actually, the article that we just mentioned, the one that is going to come out, is all about that specific experience of mine. (laughs) Um, And, you know, doing that in the way that I did it and having the support of my mentor, Lori, to really say that, you know, what you're doing is just as worthy as understanding like the academics behind what, you know, what Westernized society would tell you you're doing, like you're serving your community. And that's, and that's, that's the same thing. Right. And so um, really those student stories are what still, honestly, what, I would say predicted my trajectory into my passion for, um, you know, trying to create culturally safe spaces in, um, in colonized spaces, colonized systems, um, and really just still gives me the motivation and determination to change these things. And honestly, too, it's like the students that I get to work with, especially the indigenous youth, like the fact that I get to work with indigenous youth, I feel so honored and privileged and they uh, keep me going. They rejuvenate me for sure. And, um, and so really from there, I started, um, that's when I started presenting as well. And it started on just the, you know, at the university of Montana and then, and then locally throughout the community and then statewide and then regional. And then I moved to Arizona and now I've, you know, presented nationally like a few times. I travel a lot to present in many different states all around the country at conferences and specific organizations hire me to talk about um, creating culturally safe spaces. So it's kind of just flourished into this, um, this completely like, I'm so grateful, but this completely just, um, overarching career of serving my community and um and you know one if I stay when I stay on this path I'm always taken care of and that's like something big and I know I'm I'm on the right path so that's huge yeah that that's huge and super powerful um to carry all that right like along the path with you um so you know a big reason why I wanted to get you on here was, of course, for people to learn from you, right? For folks who follow the podcast and new people that might be listening for the first time to to learn from you so that they can, um, you know, create change um, to create or improve upon, if there's been a start already, culturally safe spaces for indigenous populations and of course, like as you said, folks can hire you for trainings as well. Um, so, you know, I'm just wondering if a place to start could be on naming the historical and currently unsafe environments for indigenous peoples. And, you know, then we can later talk about what makes a culturally safe space. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, really, um the act of colonization impacts pretty much every single system that is in our country. Uh, And especially when it's westernized based, um, that means that um, it usually doesn't include, um, you know, indigenous ways of um, of functioning or worldview or healing or even, um, you know, ways of living. And so, Um, And that's why, you know, when we're thinking about systemic oppression, systemic racism, it's very apparent with Indigenous communities because in most spaces, especially in education, we're not included in the curriculum. In most cases, it's like we don't even exist. And so um, that's something that 
obviously for because you know research shows if you can support an indigenous student's identity the most it doesn't matter what skill set you provide them whether it's like math skills writing skills if you support their identity and that's it they will be more successful in education and so you know going through a westernized education system where it literally doesn't even acknowledge your existence can be very very difficult and it's not it's not culturally safe because in most cases it literally denies your existence and your identity, right? And it doesn't include, even anything about U.S. history or, you know, American history, it doesn't include anything usually that's happened to Indigenous populations in the United States. And that in itself is an issue because of, um, in the many different ways that we still experience those things. Um, And so, you know, education, of course, is a big a big one and I primarily work in the education system and trying to change those spaces, but also, you know, throughout history and um, especially as social workers, we always think, oh, we created these amazing things that help so many people. But a lot of those things were used in order to um, inflict assimilation, cultural genocide, and even, um, you know, just continued historical oppression on many communities of color um and marginalized communities but like even for instance like the child welfare um child welfare system is a perfect example of um you know in uh, we like to think and like in my msw program you know like my professor gave me a list of all these amazing policies and things that social workers created and the child welfare systems on there. And I was like, uh, I don't really see it like that. I'm not going to lie. Mm. Um, and then I asked her, did, did you know about the Indian adoption project that happened where they literally used social workers and the child welfare system to play, to take native children from their families and place them with white families. And she had no idea. And, um, and, you know, and we still see the effects of that today in our communities and, Um, or even, you know, when we're talking about like the boarding school era too, like that had, that continues to have a huge impact on us. Um, and especially me being the, um, granddaughter and daughter boarding school survivors, it's such a huge part of even how I make my daily decisions in life. And so many people think, even if they know about it, they're like, oh, that was so long ago, but it really wasn't. And, um, and also, you know, like, even if it was that long ago, we still experience our ancestors' trauma due to what's happened to us. And so um, it's not like we can just escape that. Um, but, the, you know, like, just acknowledging that really any system, especially when it, when it um, has derived from colonization, is going to be an unsafe space for Indigenous populations. Um, and that's just the reality of because that's one of the main goals of colonization. And, um, you know, and it's really just to continue um, the historical oppression that's happened for hundreds of years. And so being really intentional about that is is extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's so like you said, I mean, anything that colonization touches and there's so many examples more than we can cover, of course, yeah. <laughs> in this conversation. Um and it's it's a global right it's mm-hmm. it's global it's a global um colonizations all over yeah it is it is global because and i think in the early 1900s eight, over 80% of the world was colonized and so that means like and it can only be inflicted upon indigenous people so that means that there's indigenous populations all around the world that have experienced the same um, act of colonization within the four stages, you know, that it happens in. And, um, and so, you know, there's populations that, um, experience some of the same, um, effects that we do here in the United States as American Indian people. Since you just mentioned it, could you briefly touch on like the four stages? Yeah. So, um, whenever I present, uh, and this is like the main presentation I usually do when I'm talking about creating culturally safe spaces. Um, I always um, first go through the four stages of colonization in the United States and how um, from an indigenous perspective. So it's pretty much just like going over hundreds of years of history from an indigenous perspective. But it is broken up into the four stages. And and this is backed by research because colonization has happened for so long all around the world. Um, but the four stages um, are exploration, exploration. Um, invasion, occupation, and assimilation. 
And um, and so in the timeline that I provide, I, I tr- I've tried to break it up into the best possible way um, into the in what happened and in each stage, um, just so people can really. And, you know, it's based on a lot of like factual information. Right. Because the important thing is, is saying like, yes, this actually happened. You can read these things. Um, this is what happened to my ancestors. And it really is, you can see how those four stages play out in the United, in the history of the United States. Um, and then again, you know, the, the effects that those, those things have had are still so um, apparent within our communities today. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's really important for people and I, a lot of people don't know about it, you know, which is part of why this is um, so problematic too, is that like, we don't learn like in, in typical U S based education, right? Like we don't learn this history. You know, this isn't something I learned. Like we learn, we, you know, there's a holiday for Christopher Columbus, who's a murderer, you know, engaged in sexual violence, mm-hmm. uh, Stole, and, I mean, and who didn't even set foot on the United States of America? Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. And the White House is like, even this year, sending out like a release, still praising him and like connecting it to like Italian Americans, which is was just like <laughs> totally insane. Yeah. And um, but like I think about also like the example you just gave of that social work class and that professor and how many indigenous students are sitting in a class and getting a lesson that is completely um, contradictory and oppressive, really um, anti-indigenous. And they're sitting in there and like you were able to, it sounds like you, you chose to say something. And, you know, I think about how many people say something and it doesn't go well or mm-hmm. are tired of trying to say something and are just like, you know, F this, like mm-hmm. I like, why am I even in, why am I here? You know, why am I in this class? Like, why is, am I doing this? Yeah. And that's very common. And, um, that honestly is what contributes to a lot of, um, you know, native students not being able to make it through a westernized education system. And yeah, and I'm, I'm known, I've, I've, if you can't tell, I've been known for a very long time to call or to cause what I call good trouble, right? I'm the student who, <laughs> definitely speaks up in classes. Um, and, uh, but not everybody does that. And I don't, and I get it. I totally understand it because the thing is, and this is what I always, when I, when I, um, present for institutions, um, you know, even in public education, because I work with a lot of public education institutions as well. Um, I always say, you know, native students are there to get an education. They're not there to be an educator. So you need to be, knowledgeable enough to be teaching these subjects and on in these topics and in, integrating them into your classes if that's what you want to do and um, and not rely on the native students to to educate everybody because that's not our job and and that's what happens a lot and even in the article I know that I wrote one of the main topics of my focus groups was tokenism and that happens so often because like a lot of times we're the only native students in a lot of the courses especially in higher education. So, you know, so a lot of times you're, you're relied on to, to educate when that's really not, you know, that puts a whole nother level of responsibility on students, which, you know, doesn't even make sense. And in some cases, you know, uh, causes students to just go home and quit education. So, yeah, like all eyes are now on you and yeah. So what are some ways that educators, practitioners, people get wrong in their attempts to actually like address this issue and maybe try to do, um, I don't know if they're trying to necessarily create a culturally safe space, but they're trying to do something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't necessarily want to put a label on it, but like land acknowledgements maybe would be like kind of example of that yeah no definitely and um you know land acknowledgements is an example because majority of the time it's very uh, performative right saying that like okay we're gonna write this we're gonna say this but 
what are the, what's the actions that follow it, right? There has to be some sort of actions that follow something like that, or else you're just saying it to, to literally, you know, on the surface level of saying, oh, we support this, this population, but that's not always the case. And usually that's not what happens, right? And so one of the biggest things, especially when I'm working with um, most, you know, non-natives on, on creating culturally safe spaces, the biggest thing that I talk about is really understanding that you're going to make mistakes. Like that is just the honest truth. Like we're humans. We make mistakes and literally we could be an expert in something and we still make mistakes. Like I still make mistakes with other native people. Like when I work with indigenous youth, especially if they grow up in a different, you know, setting than I grew up in, it happens. I've made mistakes before and I've had to, and I, and I honestly, you know, created a space that was not culturally safe. And, um, and I had to, you know, understand how to address that and, and really change, or I guess, acknowledge my personal biases, right? And my worldview when it comes to how I was raised as a Native person. But the thing is, is that we're going to make mistakes. I think one of the biggest facades or myths that Westernized education teaches us, especially as a social worker, is that we, as, as long as we get this degree, we know everything. And um, it's this hierarchy of knowledge of, especially as a social worker, uh, we have this word called competence. And um, there, and I always say there's no way you can be competent in everybody's culture. You know, being culturally competent is something that is literally a lifelong journey. And um and I don't even like saying that because it, it really is not, it's not obtainable as if you're trying to be common in someone else's culture, because you'll never know what it's like to be that part of that culture or part of that population. And so um, that's, I think, one of the biggest things that I always, I tell a lot of people and, you know, when you're looking at it from um, an indigenous perspective, there really is no hierarchy of knowledge because every single person contributes some sort of knowledge or, um, you know, learning style or education to the community. Um, no matter if they have a degree, no matter if they are a child, no matter if they're an adult, right? Everybody has the same opportunity to teach someone something. And that facade that Westernized education teaches us, it causes a lot. It Honestly, it does more harm than it does help because pretty much it teaches us, oh, once you know these things about this population, then you can go help them and or you can serve them and you can do these things. But like in, in most cases, if you're learning just assumptions or stereotypes, especially about Native populations, because, you know, in most statistics, we're leading in, in, you know, in, in the worst statistics in the country. And if that's all you're learning in classes, then it's not good to go in the community. And that's the only knowledge, you know, and you're making those assumptions about every client that you're working with, because when you make those assumptions, that in itself can, um, is the opposite of creating culturally safe spaces, because you're placing your own um, bias on what this person should maybe look like, act like, um, be like, right? Um, even where they should live, where they should have been raised, how they should have been raised. Because Westernized society, when we're not included in curriculum, then you don't honestly know a lot of how we even function. Um, and so so that's like one of the biggest, um, when I say myths or facades that Westernized education tries to teach us is that, um, especially if we get to the level of like being faculty or being a doctor, right? Like we're seen as this like expert in our area or expert in these things. And in all honesty, if you don't continue to be a lifelong learner, then you're not going to continue to know how to serve communities that you don't belong to. And that's really, um, that's really how it is. And so when I talk about creating culturally safe spaces, I mostly talk about practicing cultural humility, which I'll talk a little bit more about when I actually um, say the definition of creating culturally safe spaces. Yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking about this article by Gordon Pond, who I know uh, you know his work, um, the culturally cultural competency is new racism, and yeah. apology of forgetting, and it's such a good article and so important to just completely shatter that myth um and call it what it is because i i think that concept was probably trying to be helpful at one mm -hmm. point and it's just done so much damage 
this mm-hmm. idea that like we can be competent and other like the whole competence thing <laughs> too is like as you're saying it's just so it's a colonizer mentality of like i'm gonna be in control of this i'm gonna be so competent like i'm gonna be so in control that i'm competent right. in this right over this mm-hmm. and i think too it's like it makes it is it is honestly it's like control and and power because um and you know that's what colonization literally thrives off of but um because it also tells you that you have the power to have access to whoever you want to help because you have mm. this competence and that you know and that's and that's not the case because a lot of times if you if you're coming from that perspective you're doing more harm and and I think that, and that's that's the one of the you know biggest um, issues with this the um, social work profession is that people think they can go in because they want to be saviors, but that's not that's not how it works. And um, and but yet we still have you know social work curriculums that still teach that. So that's part of the issue too. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think it seems like a lot of it came from like the medical, like medicine and. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, whenever I think like, why does social work want to replicate medicine? And and it always seems to come back to this like professional, trying to have this professional, this profession, you know, that gets taken seriously. Um, And that's all part of like this problem that Mm -hmm. we're talking about. It is. And, you know, too, like being, um, rooted in that like westernized colonial mindset as a profession too it really does like like you mentioned like it's like not only um power and control but it's that you have to have a solution to every problem it's a very linear way of thinking and so when we're working with people when we're trying to help them solve their problems right or or give them you know provide them resources to better their life then we all we always a lot of times we're taught from this linear perspective. So then we think that this is how we solve problems when, you know, in all honesty, that's not how, that's not how life works. <laughs> There's more things right. than just us that contribute to our welfare. <laughs> so, yeah. So one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you just in terms of, I mean, you, you mentioned some of it in terms of like native students, you know, struggling to finish westernized education um leaving going home like from higher ed for example and in that article you know you have some stuff in there too about like acting less native and i was hoping you could talk a little bit about that or anything else you want to add in just terms of like some of the impacts of culturally unsafe spaces before we shift into safe spaces yeah, I mean, then, yeah, in the article, there's um, a lot of, um, like, specific examples that came from students. Like, I had them in our my focus groups, I had them write down on pieces of paper what their experiences were in these four categories, and um, and then they talked about it to, to build a network, right, and support, but also to, like, talk about similar experiences. And, um, and what's crazy is I literally had to type up every single one of those <laughs> responses into, you know, qualitative data uh, program. And I had no idea what I was doing and I would do it very differently if I did it again. But the, I think one of the, um, some of the quotes that came out, you know, especially from students, which is very common for native students is that um, when, especially when we talk about the act of assimilation, like the, the main purpose of you, and some people even consider our education system today a modern day version of assimilation because we continue to not be included in our, in the curriculum, which means that, um, we, we technically have to assimilate into this westernized society in order to be deemed successful and receive a degree. And, um, but yet, we um and so we might do things right in the educational setting that might um in our, and sometimes in our case we might believe that might make us more successful like for instance you know um what what is more commonly known as like code switching right where we talk completely different we might um you know uh, get involved in things that are that don't support necessarily who we are, but it's something that the university would recommend, right? 
or even, you know, not speak up in class like that, you know, or even, you know, not correct the professor if they say something wrong. And so, and because we, and uh, we're constantly um, in what we would call walking into worlds, meaning that we're functioning from this worldview and this way of living and requires um, such collectivist support for who we are. Um, and that's how we naturally are, yet we have to navigate the Western system that doesn't even acknowledge who we are. And so we constantly have to navigate those two things. And um, there are ways, of course, creating culturally safe spaces is definitely a um, strategy to help students navigate both worlds. But in most cases, um, we're surrounded by, um, uh, you know, we're in spaces and we're surrounded by people who don't know these things. And so we constantly have to um, either be less native or we just have to really understand how to function from a westernized perspective. Um, and sometimes, you know, even when I think about me being in this higher, the, the highest level you could be in education, um, you know, I know that my, I, you know, in the work that I do, it, it, it's the reason why I'm able to do this. It's the reason why I'm able to be in a PhD program. But also I know that um, in order for students to um, even be successful, like they need that as well. And, um, and you know, and that's that, that it's, I mean, it's proved through research, but, um, and sometimes though, you know, for me is I support Native students where no matter where they're at, because um, they could, they, you know, Native people deserve unconditional support for who they are because of the historical impact that we, we've been through. And, um, and really, especially with students, you know, if they got to do what they got to do to make it through the system and get a degree, they deserve that support. And um, that's always the approach I try to take when I work with Native students. Yeah, as you were talking, I was wondering about like, what this has all been like for you because like you said you're you've been through a lot of western education yeah. and you're in it now and and i and i know like like you've said like you're doing it because it because of the work you can do and the benefit for your community mm -hmm. do you do you feel like you've had like that you've lost some of who you are in the process or do you feel like you've been able to like retain or and even enhance some of that who, who you are I, I don't know I'm having trouble exactly wording it but maybe <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean I know what you mean um you know I feel like it's been a little bit of both because there are sacrifices that as native people we have to make right and a lot of times like for instance you know there's fa if there's a faculty member here at ASU which this is just like so profound to me because we talk about sacrifices when I work with students all the time especially some of my mentors or my best friends who have you know their doctorates or who are you know lawyers and all these different things and they talk about the sacrifices all the time you know like I had to be away from my community for so many years in order to now return and do what I want to do and this faculty mem member here at ASU he's he was away from his community for 20 years and he got, and now he's a doctor. Now he, and he got, and he moved back to now he works here at ASU and he's able to be in his home community and work at ASU. And that is like, that blew my mind because, you know, I, and obviously personally, I know of the sacrifices I've made. You know, I don't, I moved to Arizona alone. I don't have family here. I don't, um, you know, I d really didn't know anybody here when I moved here. And, um, and, you know, and I, my, I get to see my family a lot, thankfully, because I travel a lot back to Montana to um, work doing in my consulting business. And I'm very grateful for that. But leaving my family, it never gets easier um, every single time. Like, even if we have the best time of our life, that actually makes it harder. <laughs> we have the best mm -hmm. time, you know, because it's and I was just telling someone recently, like, it honestly never gets easier. And I know that's like that's the sacrifice I'm making in order to have this sort of impact that I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm meant to do, you know, at this point in my life. And, um, or even like, you know, not being super present in my nephew's lives, you know, my brother's children. And, um, that's also a sacrifice I have to make. But if anything, I think it's 
like the opportunity that I've had in in really focusing on my true passion and purpose of serving my community has opened doors like like nothing else here in Arizona and even all around the nation, um, getting the opportunities I've had. And I know that that in itself has really strengthened my identity and, you know, and even who I am spiritually as an Indigenous person. And so it is kind of, it's it's a little bit of both, but I know that because of those, um, you know, those uh, benefits that I've had that have strengthened my identity has definitely set me up for success to be able to tackle this PhD program on this level. Um, and I, you know, I know that for a fact and, and because I can continue to do my consulting during my, even though, you know, it's a lot, but it is what rejuvenates me. So, um, so that's a, that's a benefit too. Yeah. That's so interesting. Like (laughs) everything you just said (laughs) is just really interesting. And and uh, like you were saying, like these things don't go in a straight line, right? Yeah. Um, life, like you said, life doesn't work like that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's shift into how people can create culturally safe spaces for Indigenous folks. Um, like what maybe are some key ways and obviously acknowledging that it's impossible to cover all of it in, a, in this <laughs> one podcast episode i mean we've you and i talked about this when we talked before like this could be a whole podcast series you know in and of itself yeah definitely and um even you know like and it's funny because when i when i present like i think a couple nights ago i did a guest lecture for a course at the University of Montana, like virtually. <laughs> She's like, I want to give you all three hours. And I'm like, oh, I won't talk for all three hours. And I totally talked for all three hours. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but yeah, so the official definition of creating culturally safe spaces, which actually was coined by a Maori nurse in New Zealand, because as we everybody should know, New Zealand is like the Mecca for indigenous everything. Um, and, um, I hope to live there someday for at least some amount of time, but they, uh, it was coined by a Maori nurse. And it, what it means is it's an environment where there's no assault, deny, denial, or challenge of someone's identity. So it's really like truly listening and it's, um, learning from the person of how they identify in order to provide that support. And so, um, so what that means is that, you know, it combats like that facade that we talked about of, you know, oh, you're going into this space and you know all of the things already and making those assumptions. Because once, like I mentioned before, if you make those assumptions, right, like let's say um, uh, for an Indigenous student um, and you make the assumption that every um, Native person must speak their language, and you go into this space and you say, oh, um, so tell me a word in your language or something like that. And they don't speak their language. You're then challenging their identity. And they might think, oh, maybe I'm not Native enough for this person, right? And that could have like detrimental emotional reactions in some people. And so the approach that I take whenever I talk about creating culturally safe spaces um, also, like I mentioned before, is um is going through a timeline of history from an Indigenous perspective and talking about how history continues to impact not only our communities through historical intergenerational trauma, but also our identity. And it leads to our identity being super, super complex. So really, it is not possible to even go in a room and have these assumptions and they always be right. Because even as, like I said, even as a Native person, when I work with Native students, I also have to take some of these same approaches to learning from students how they identify. And um, one of the tools that I talk about when I, um, when that I, you know, provide to participants on, on what could really help them is the um, cultural iceberg. I don't know if you ever heard of the cultural iceberg, um, but it, it pretty much just is a metaphor for how uh, culture is so in depth and it takes into account so many different things, which also includes your worldview. And it's some things that, you know, you might not do and you don't even know it. And so, um, I always show like the diagram and you can Google it, the cultural iceberg, but I always show the diagram and explain some of the things, what we call like deep culture, things that you don't see on the surface. And, um, and I hang that in, in every office I work in, because even when I'm working with native students, there's probably some things that I'm not 
um, taking into account or there's things that maybe I'm getting triggered by because of my worldview that might be mm-hmm. in the deep culture that could, you know, hinder my ability to even create that culturally safe space. And so, um, and so there's, you know, a few different factors, like I mentioned, one is the historical impact. And then two is understanding how that historical impact um, creates um, this, uh, what we call this cultural spectrum for indigenous people, meaning that every single one of us identifies differently, but it doesn't matter how we identify it. You know, as long as we just, as long as we identify as indigenous and wherever we lie on that spectrum, we deserve unconditional support for our identity because a lot of times those things aren't our fault because of historic, the historical impact. Like, for instance, you know, being the daughter of a boarding school survivor, I don't speak my language. And um, and my father still struggles to this day speaking his language. And so um, I didn't learn it growing up. And same with my grandma, my mom's side, who raised me. You know, she was in boarding school and she never spoke our language either. And so that's a perfect example of how, you know, that history continues to impact us. But if you don't know that, then you might not have what we would call, you know, that holistic perspective of that we're still influenced by the what our ancestors went through and you're not going to learn that in a westernized education system so it's important also to to you know do your own research have your own knowledge so you're going in these spaces and you at least have foundational knowledge on what this looks like um and and you know and that means that student or any any native person that you're going to work with they're going to feel that support and again, you're probably going to make mistakes, but the more humility you have of going into that space and saying, you know what, I'm here to learn, you know, like, I just want to know about you. I want to know, you know, specific ways that you identify and, and, um, and that, you know, being genuine and having that humility can completely change the way that people work with Indigenous people. One of the things you mentioned earlier is Indigenous ways of functioning and living. And I was hoping maybe you could share a little bit more about that and also how that contrasts, I guess, with like the westernized way. Yeah. So that's actually something that I touch on too when I, when I uh, present, because it's important to have that le- some level of self-awareness, right? And um, as we know, like what I, and then this is the one ask I usually ask people when they're in my training is to practice critical thinking skills of, you know, self-awareness, self-reflection and critically challenging what they're learning. And, um, and I, um, and so I do talk a lot about what we call indigenous worldview or more of a collectivist way of functioning versus a westernized worldview, which focuses more on individualism. And so, when you think of like a collectivist worldview or collectivist way of functioning, it definitely um, is more focused on, um, well, kind of exactly what it says, a collective, right? And so a lot of times when you're making um, individual decisions in your life, the, um, the betterment or the health of your family or community is going to be a priority during that individual decision-making process. So what that means is like, for instance, when I work with Native students, or I'm a perfect example, right? I've dedicated my entire career and um, life pretty much to serving my community. So when I was in my undergrad and I was deciding what degree to get or what degree to, or, you know, profession to go in, the betterment of my community was always a priority when making that decision. And so sometimes, a lot of times it contrasts with Westernized society because we were colonized by more of an individualistic worldview. And Westernized systems tend to function more from that worldview. And so again, when we're nav- we're having to navigate both of these ways of, um, of functioning, right? And it doesn't mean that one way is, you know, right, one way is wrong. It just, it acknowledges the fact that each and every one of us functions differently. And um, even as an Indigenous person, you know, there are some westernized individualistic ways that I've adapted because obviously I've made it through education to this point. You know, there's some things that I've had to take into account in my way of functioning um, where, you know, it's, it's really on a scale. But the more that you know about like where on that scale you function from, the more you're going to be able to understand how you imp- impact others around you and also have the, you know, realization that people come from different realities than you do and people naturally function differently than you do. So maybe they're making different decisions in their life that maybe you might not think are okay, but it might be okay to them because they function from a different worldview. Um, 
And I think that's one of the biggest things too, when I work with Native students, because, you know, persistence within American Indian students is really, really high. And that means that even if they do step away from education, there's a really high chance that they're going to come back and they're going to finish. But that also means that usually they're not in like, you know, the four year degree plan. Right. And um, it might take longer or, you know, they might come back and your average native student is actually a, um, a, a non-traditional single mother. That's usually your average native student. And so whenever I work with native students, I think part of this whole process is really, you know, taking into account that they're the experts in their own life. And if they need to go home, if they need to take care of their family, if they, you know, if they miss so many classes because they had to go home for funerals or if they had to go home to um, practice ceremony, I will be the one to say that is okay. And when you come back, you can come back to me because I'll be here and I support you 100 percent no matter what, because you know that even them trying to fit in this world of, you know, what what Western society tells us of success. Um, they already have people. They're probably telling themselves that they're not supposed to do that. But the thing is, is that their worldview is worthy of recognition and it's worthy of support. And so that's another approach that I always try to um, teach because that in itself too is creating a culturally safe space for them to know that their worldview and the way that they naturally function and their value sets are um, are supported. Yeah, as you were saying that, like, and, and I can't remember if this is like a conversation we were having or if it's in the article, um, but like attendance policies and bereavement policies like are often like really problematic, right? Yeah, extremely. You know, when I worked with Native students, I I had students where professors asked them to literally um, turn in like obituaries with their with their assignments um or if they weren't listed in the obituary as like kin then they didn't get excused for their absence um or even you know like even for ceremony or like spiritual practices which that in itself is what is going to keep a native student and make them more successful it's going to keep them in education right is if they have the opportunity to do those things um, and you know, the, um, the research that, um, I did and that the articles and it, I think it was in the article, but the articles about that actually, um, resulted in creating a policy at the university of Montana for, um, cultural leave for students so that professors couldn't use it against them. Um, and it couldn't impact their grade to some extent. Um, if they were, if they chose to go home or miss class because of a cultural reason. Um, and so there's, you know, there's opportunity for change and there's also definitely some solutions to, um, systems really taking these things into account and implementing them, um, in these, what we would consider unsafe spaces. Yeah. I think that's like a really clear, like policy change that it's like that people can do. And if they're their organization or whatever institution they're in isn't doing it, they could hopefully, you know, implement it on their own until it gets done on a larger scale. You know, I mean, the whole attendance thing in higher ed and well, really K-12 and higher ed is yeah, like what's excused, what's not excused is like just so problematic. Yeah, um, it really is. So many levels. Who has access to health care to get a doctor's note and why should they share it? Why do they have to share it with anybody, you know, like right. any person, uh, any personal business really, you know? Mm-hmm. What other um, practices have, you know, you found to be really helpful, you know, in creating culturally safe spaces for indigenous folks? <laughs> I think another one is to um, really, truly understand how these, um, you know, challenges or assaults on people's identity really does can trigger intense emotional reactions in people. And, you know, sometimes if you do make mistakes and you do 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 those things, it's really important to understand that, um, you know, like a a person's emotional reaction could literally be to not come back to you for services. But hopefully if you get the opportunity to make things better, um, 
the, it's very likely that they'll still have a reaction. And um, I think that's really important to take into account too, because, um, you know, it's, it's all about um, that, what I keep saying, like that holistic perspective, you know, so many things impact a person's ability or whether we're working with clients or even students and things like that, um, their ability to really, uh, you know, navigate life really in general. But um, also, you know, I do a lot of resiliency skill development with indigenous youth and tribal communities. And so um, that's another uh, component of um, tangible, uh, you know, uh, strategies that you can use. And um, I really enjoy this because, you know, research shows um, through um, epigenetics, um, research shows that uh, American Indian populations, um, because we experienced long periods of trauma, it now has impacted our biology. And so we're born thinking that we've already experienced direct trauma when we haven't, but you can see, you know, that literally proves intergenerational trauma, meaning that we're only, we're not only experiencing our own lived experiences, right? We're experiencing hundreds of years of grief and, and, you know, even, you know, cultural genocide. And, and sometimes you see that, especially when you're working with clients and especially when you're working with the youth, because every single person is different. The way that I handle my intergenerational trauma is completely different from the way my brother handles it. Even though we're raised in the same space by the same people, it's very, very different. And it can look different. And when you're thinking about like behavioral issues and things like that, but when we talk about epigenetic, epigenetics, it also shows that um, we have a natural um, uh, sense of resiliency within our way of functioning. So not only are we surrounded by people in our community who made it through all of these things that we're, we weren't supposed to make it through, and so we our communities literally embody resilience, but we as individuals embody resilience because and I tell youth this all the time in tribal communities. I said, you you already have the skill sets inside of you to make it through any adversity that you're ever going to experience in your life. And that was passed down. Like, yeah, we talk about trauma a lot with our ancestors, but the biggest and most important thing that they passed down was their resilience and their survival. And that is such a huge thing to focus on um, when you're talking about helping um, Native people navigate westernized, the westernized world and, you know, even in education or even if, you know, just in, in general, just to heal. And so um, the resiliency skill development is, um, I found this list of resiliency skills um, from research from one of my previous supervisors here at ASU. And um, she did her research with fam families who were in the child welfare system, but I took that list and I was like, hey, I'm going to turn this into some like activities that I do with some tribal communities and indigenous youth. And so pretty much what I do is um, I have them identify, um, like I bring up the list of resiliency skills and I have them identify, you know, what's what's one skill that you feel like you already use? Maybe if you're having a hard day at school, a hard day at work and when you get home, what's something, you know, one of them is like creativity, like maybe you write, maybe you draw, maybe you're involved in theater, right? Or one is um, humor, which we all know natives are really funny. And so we tend, we text, you know, we tend to like go towards that. And that's seen as a coping mechanism. So it makes sense, right? And then social support is another one and spirituality. And so those are the top four that a lot of um, indigenous people, well, I would say a lot of natives use that I work with. Um, but identifying identifying those things and then identifying also how they already use them is going to help them develop those skill sets more as positive coping skills within their life. And so that in itself is, um, you know, like even with youth, I'll do like an activity where I'll have them either write about the skill set they use or even draw it, right? Illustrate it or create something, build something that, you know, that represents them doing this or what they use in order to, to you know, act out this resiliency skill. Um, and then I talk about, you know, is there any skill that you feel like you need to work on? <laughs> and of course, you know, there's always one and I'm very transparent with anyone I trained, but, you know, I talk about the ones that I know I would, would really benefit from if I did those things. And so that's another, um, uh, activity, like tangible activity that I teach a lot of, um, my, uh, you know, participants in the trainings I do. And I actually will do these activities with, 
um, tribal communities and indigenous youth. So that actually, I, I mean, I've done them with non-natives too, but, you know, just really tapping into that resilience is another great way and strategy to really focus on that healing component and a positive aspect to um, identity and healing, or I guess, and I guess intergenerational healing, I should say. I love that. I think that's really, I just think that's awesome. I really love that. Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm not, I just, I'm imagining what that looks like and it's (laughs) it's probably, it's probably a really cool experience. Yeah. You know, and sometimes too, I will have people create their own cultural iceberg. That's another activity that I do with people because that also builds their, their um, self-awareness, but also for like native people, it really like um, validates the way that they function and their worldview. And, you know, because one of the one of the things in the cultural iceberg is concept of time, which is like under in, you know, what they call like beneath below sea level in the deep culture. And I always tell, you know, because we run on people color time, we run on what we call Indian time. And it's like a real thing and it's called polychronic time. And so I always validate people that I train if they function from that because I know I function from that, that you know, way of, of valuing time. And, and it, that's literally what it means, though, is that we just value time differently dependent on what we what our, our beliefs and values are in our life and our worldview. And so um, that's another thing that, you know, in itself, it just validates a lot of people's ways of functioning, which can be really helpful in um, in actually learning how to use these skill sets with others. So, like, I know about the time thing, but that term polychronic time, I've never heard that before. Yeah, I learned it in my undergrad. Actually, Lori, my mentor, taught it to me. <laughs> and uh, I learned it in my undergrad um, because, you know, when I did my focus groups, uh, of course, I had like, like, okay, it has to start this, but we had like food, people brought their kids, right? It's like, just this whole space where I'm like, you know what, as long as you're here, as long as you're contributing, that's all that matters. And um, they, uh, and then Lori was like, and of course, things did not go on time, which, tech, <laughs> right. which always happens, tends to happen. But, um, uh, but the important thing is, is that like people stayed like over the time because they were so invested. And that in itself just shows you that, like, it doesn't need to happen in a linear fashion, you know. And and I think even being open to that. And that's when Lori was like, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's called, like, polychronic time when you're, like, when you're not functioning from that, like, linear, um, you know, time. What is it called? You know, uh, structure of time. And so I just thought that was honestly, since they've told me that literally it's changed my life so um yeah so i i so i want to share that with people who also function in that way so they yeah. can be validated i never knew that term so i like as we're talking i just googled it right because yeah. i knew about this that con obviously different concepts of time um but like polychronic well, monochronic is like one thing at a time, like just focus only able to focus on kind of like one thing at a time, like you're saying, like very linear and mm-hmm. um and polychronic is like there's a lot going on and mm-hmm. like relationships, you know, are valued more than like doing exactly. something on time, whatever. Yeah, and I always I always use an example of like, you know, if I'm going to I have to be this meeting on time for work, but then I see my cousin on my way to this meeting. Like, I'm not going to be that meeting on time. Like, I'm just going to talk to my cousin. Right. You know, because I value, re- especially coming from like more of a collectivist community, I value relationships and kinships way more <laughs> than than time, you know? And that's just, that's a perfect example. Of that. And that's happened so many times. <laughs> you kind of just touched on this as you were talking about the resiliency skill set and. Um, but you bring this up in the article too. You talk about survivance, mm-hmm. survivance, and you also talk about indigenous existence being revolutionary. Mm-hmm. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about both of those concepts. Yeah. So survivance in itself, I think that because, you know, when I talk about this topic, especially because, um, Primarily, I am teaching people who function more from a westernized worldview, right? And so it's that, you know, and, and I understand, like, when you, sometimes the first, the, when I, they see my presentations, the first time they're even like, wait, there's different worldviews? Like, 
you know, like, and then, and then <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, it's like so mind blowing. And honestly, those sometimes to indigenous people it's the same thing, but they like are like, Wow, you just validated me. I never felt that. But for um sometimes, you know, people who function from a, a more westernized worldview, they might then be like, Oh, okay, so then but they're still like functioning from that like, oh, okay, well you just mentioned all these problems. Like tell me the solution, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, well, no, I'm telling you that you have to take all this into account in order to come up with your own solution when you're working with people. It's not just the like. They want a prescription. Exactly. Or they want me to tell them, like, do this. And I felt, I've, I've felt like that before. And yeah. it was pointed out to me that that's a colonial mentality. <laughs> <laughs> and it really, I mean, even think about like science, right? Like. The yeah, Western science it's the same concept right it's like oh well this proves this so this is how it is and um and so a lot of times when i'm talking about like worldview it it just means also that it's very very complex even though like i talk about all of these things that happen to american indian populations and how it impacts our communities today it doesn't mean that everybody in our community and and honestly, most of us don't know these things because we go through the same public education as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's very intentional that we don't learn about these things. You know, everybody, especially us, right? Um, when they say like an educated Indian is like the government's worst nightmare, but it's honestly like, it's true. And um, yeah, look what they did to the American Indian movement. Literally, exactly. Right. They like dismantled it. And so um and so when, when we're especially thinking about, you know, this idea of survivance, it's a different perspective that our ancestors, some of our ancestors had, and they had to um, function from this idea of survivance in order to literally survive. And so sometimes when you're talking about these experiences, like, for instance, like even sometimes with boarding school survivors, they look back and see their experience as something as like super positive, or they see it as like, um, um, or they just, they just see it differently. And in some cases, you know, and in some cases, like maybe that was the case, but in a lot of cases, like they still experience really bad things. It's just that in order to survive that time, they only focused on the good. And that's literally what we would consider survivance. And so, and so that term in itself, you know, that, that adds to the complexity of even this whole healing journey or healing process that we're, especially as social workers, we're always going to be a part of someone's healing journey, right? And, uh, well, hopefully that's our goal, <laughs> but. Yeah, um, <laughs> or social, or the, or people are doing social control and. Right, that's or, a, or that's the a whole other problem. <laughs> <laughs> or that's it. But yeah, and so, you know, that and it like survivance in itself just shows that there's um, such a, a diverse, there's so many diverse ways of um, handling and, and, you know, pretty much just um, dealing with trauma. And, um, and, you know, another one is um, when we're even talking about like internalized oppression, too, you know, like I touch on that sometimes when I'm presenting, because, you know, I even had professors who who teach, you know, American Indian history or, you know, history from indigenous perspective. And they say, you know, some of my native students, they they don't believe me or they don't want to hear it or they don't they don't want to, like, get to that place of like acknowledging that they're still impacted by this. And, you know, and I and this happened, I did a presentation for um, San Antonio Texas, or I can't remember, remember the institution's name, but Lori and I did a presentation together on this topic. And one of the professors brought that up. And I, and I told her, I said, I said, you know, um, we're all on a different um, path in our healing journey. And some people experience um, some, you know, probably experience some level of internalized depression. And that means that, you know, the that's literally the goal of oppression is to make the oppressed believe the things that the oppressor is telling them. And sometimes that can result in, in people not, um, you know, being able to um, believe the information or even, or make the connections or not even wanting to. And I told, you know, and I said that, and that's, that's okay because, you know, if we're really supporting people on all this entire spectrum of what it means to heal or even means to identify as indigenous, 
then we have to acknowledge that oppression really has impacted us on in, you know, pretty much in every aspect. Um, and so internalized oppression is also something that, um, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily sim. Well, in a way, I guess it's similar to surveillance because it's a way of surviving, but, um, but it's, it's really just these different ways that people deal with their trauma and what has happened to them and our ancestors. But especially, you know, when I work with youth, like, the whole, you know, I say indigenous existence is, I would say your existence is the resistance. Like you existing in these spaces is literally revolutionary because we were never supposed to, we're not meant to be even a part of these spaces. We're not meant to even, you know, make it this far. And the fact that we're thriving is, is extraordinary. And that's something to, you know, really acknowledge and take into account and I think too is like it's important to also acknowledge because me and my friends always talk about this too of like you know a lot of times we think that leaving the reservation is success and um you know and this is like me and my other friends who have left the res <laughs> I mean we, we grew up on the res but we're like oh we gotta get off the res you know go be successful but leaving the res doesn't mean that you don't have to be successful or you don't okay you don't have to uh, leave the rest, the res to be successful. You can be successful in your community. And that's big. That is huge. Because even when I think about like me, like, yes, I have the ability to leave home and be away from home. But some people don't, right? Like I have friends who, yeah, went to school and became doctors. But as soon as the day literally after they graduated, they moved back home. And that's okay because, you know, we need we need people in our community that are preserving our language, our culture, and serving, you know, even the the um, departments and the, and the institutions on our res, right? Because for me, it's like, I'm going to support that regardless. So no matter what, where you're at or how you identify as an, as an indigenous person, like your existence is literally revolutionary and it's going to change every single space that you're in. And I tell native students that all the time. I say, you might be the only native student in that classroom, but know that you being in that classroom, you're changing the environment completely, just your presence. And, or even like me, if you do have, you know, the courage to speak up, then your words are also changing the environment for other students and or even for other Native students, maybe in the class that don't have the courage to speak up. And so I always tell Indigenous youth that all the time because, because you know, it's important for them to feel empowered and know that their strength from their ancestors is, is something to be, um, you know, completely proud of. And, and also I always say, you know, like our ancestors stayed strong enough for us to be here. So we're going to stay strong enough for um, future generations. And, and that's really how we look at it, right? We always take into, um, into account seven generations before us and seven generations after us, because we're going to be ancestors one day. And I think that's one of the most, um, you know, like honored thing to do is know that I can have an influence and an impact on, on people who come after me. And, um, and that's just important. And it looks many, it, it, you know, it looks different in many different ways, right? It's not just this, um, way that Westernized society tells us it's literally in any way you possibly could imagine. And, um, and that's what we're meant to do. And that's what our ancestors, um, wanted us to do. And, um, and you know, they prayed for the best thing that they could and it's giving us life and that's why we're here. So yeah, I would say we're pretty, uh, revolutionary. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, there's like so many things I want to talk with you about <laughs> and I know we're, we're going to wrap up, um, cause we're already going over an hour and, and, um, but you know, we sh will hopefully we'll ha have you back on here, or maybe yes. we'll collaborate on some other um, stuff. So before we wrap up, I just want to make sure: is there anything you know you want to add? Um, you know that we didn't get into. Well, I know there's so much more we could get into, <laughs> but like just fall. We're still on this episode. Um, if there's anything you want to add. Um. I think I talked about a lot, pretty much everything I want to talk about. And I never do this, but I'm going to uh, say, if you want to learn more, you can hire me. 
<laughs> well, I hope you do that more because yeah. people should be paying you. Um, <laughs> and and what you're doing is really important. And this is like a whole other episode or multiple episodes, but like this whole push of like decolonizing the curriculum mm-hmm. and decolonizing this and decolonizing that and decolonizing social work and, you know, um, what that means and who's doing it and where, what they're basing it on and all of that, you know, it's like, right. people can hire you and <laughs> yeah, you get can some help that. along the way. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when I, I think one of the biggest things that like, just um, for me that has like proved um, and keeps me doing the work that I do is that um, all of every single opportunity I've ever gotten, because I've done pretty much no marketing on my work. And so every opportunity I've gotten for the last seven years has only been from word of mouth or someone has seen me present and works for a different organization or has recommended me. And so I think that in itself is so profound. But that means I need to learn how to market myself. <laughs> and this is a great opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Turquoise, thank you so mm-hmm. much for sharing all of this knowledge, you know, and I, I've i learned a lot talking with you and I, I know folks um, listening and or reading the transcripts because um, we always have a transcript mm-hmm. or, you know, we're going to learn so much too. And I just want to really thank you for coming on the podcast. And most importantly, thank you for doing the work. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was so great to be here. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, please get in touch. And thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place.